Good evening. Welcome to Tap History Nights. That was Miss Ella Fitzgerald performing in the year 1960 in Australia. I'm not sure where exactly. Wonderful, wonderful concert and the full things on uh, YouTube. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. Nice to see uh, some lovely faces. How is everyone? Good morning or good evening or good afternoon. Um, 
again, please feel free to use the chat uh, as much as you like. It's um, nice to keep things lively. And if you'd like to shout out, please shout out. Um, I just ask that we keep uh, microphones muted whilst the, the videos are playing and it uh, keeps it going a little bit smoother because it's still rather tricky with modern day technology and bandwidth and all this business. But um, this is brought to you by 1929 Studios, which is run by Miss Ramona Staffeld, organizing some wonderful swing and jazz dance related things in Australia and worldwide via the internet. And she's here with us tonight. Um, mm -hmm. And tonight is the Hoofers Club part two, because we didn't, we got like, a little ways uh, into it, uh, the previous two weeks ago. Um, and what do you think of my, my new scenery, by the way? I had to travel quite a long way to arrive here, but I think I found the perfect place to present from. It may change next time, we shall see. Um, also, these reactions are, are great. Uh, they don't actually show up uh, sometimes, but there's like there's love hearts, there's claps, there's funny things. They're great. Uh, interaction is lovely, just so it doesn't feel like I'm speaking into the void. And please, please ask questions, and I shall try my best to answer them. Um, I came on foot, actually, to hear Andrea. Well, let's get started. Last week, we, um, well, two weeks ago now, it was a bit chaotic, but we talked about the Hoofers Club being a, a small venue in Harlem throughout the mid 1920s to perhaps late 1930s. And it was very much the hangout spot of tap dancers, up and coming tap dancers, veteran tap dancers. And in this place, they would uh, they'd gamble and they'd be smoking and they'd be dancing together. And it was quite a nice place. And apparently the floor had to be replaced every six months or so because there was so much dancing going on. But the, they were lucky to have the proprietor of the, the place was very fond of tap dancing, as many people were in this era. And was kind enough to replace the floor. I can't imagine anywhere doing this nowadays. I mean, it's hard enough to find a wooden floor that people will let us dance on, let alone give us a wooden floor and six months later be like, oh, here's a new one for you. <laughs> one day, one day. Times they are changing, as says Mr. Dillon. Um, but yeah, so this was a place. There was the Tree of Hope we talked about briefly, this uh, big blossoming tree that stood in the center of Harlem, I imagine it. I don't know where it is exactly. It shifted several times. I actually tried to hunt it down when I was in New York, but it's a bit sad. Now it's actually just a little plaque in the middle of the road. Uh, it's a little bit ugly, but it, once upon a time it was a tree. Now it's this strange installation on a busy road. Um, but for quite like a decade or two, this, this place was pretty well known. And I mean, performers would come here if they wanted to feel old lady luck and then give the tree a little bit of a rub or a kiss and they'd be blessed for their performance. This was the tree of hope. And also, I mean, it was a convenient place to meet and hang out and gossip and all this kind of business. And what else did we talk about? That was pretty much it. Like what kind of went on in the Hofus Club, there was a lot of informal jams. There was a lot of competition uh, also. It was very competitive thing i think uh, jazz and music and dance in general just because it was many people's livelihood so to succeed at this um i want to say financially but maybe that's not the right word um to continue in this thing over several years you had to be pretty good at what you did because there were so many people doing it and tap dance was crazy popular um but so there was a lot of action in this particular place, the Hoofers Club. A lot of challenges went on and some people took it more seriously, some people less so. There's people like Earl Basie, otherwise known as Groundhog, who apparently went hunting down other tap dancers that he would train to defeat in battle. And there's stories like this of musicians too. Uh, it's quite funny. And, and some people do this nowadays as well, but I feel in general, the tap scene has calmed 
considerably for the most part um, in terms of personal relations. Um, but yes, there was competitions going on to, to be accepted into the Hoofers Club was a whole other thing. You had to, I mean, again, kind of prove yourself and uh, stealing steps was a huge thing. You, but you had to make it your own. You could never, you had to shape the, these raw materials that were given you and express yourself as yourself, which I think is a very essential part of jazz quite generally and it's and it was hugely respected i mean if you're able to do that as as now i mean if you see people perform or sing or dance and, and they're really themselves on stage i think you feel that and it's it's probably one of the most magic and powerful forces in the universe perhaps um but and for this reason it was well respected in harlem in the 1920s and 30s and 40s was the Hoofers Club existed. Um, but at some point it shut down several times, open, shut down, open, shut down. And that was that. And then no longer exists. Uh, there's different haunts, I'm sure people have used over the years, but there was quite a dip in things as we perhaps know during the 1950s and onwards. The, the war could have been a big part to do with it, the depression. Um, the nature of entertainment changed drastically. But we, we talked a little bit about Newport Jazz Festival, which happened mid fifties, it began. And it was this young couple's aim to bring jazz to the young folks once again, which I think is a very noble and excellent mission. And it, uh, I think succeeded. I mean, it, it led to the popularity of such people as Miles Davis and really brought some people into the public eye and older performers as well. But soon after, we spoke also about Marshall Stearns, who has a big role as a tap historian, um, which I am not, I'm a mere spurt of uh, things. Um, but he, he was the first, I believe, to write a book on the history of jazz dancing, um, encompassing tap dance, swing, lindy hop, all these styles that were about dancing and expressing yourself to jazz music. Um, which has been integral to jazz since the beginning of jazz time. Um, but people had already forgotten this by this stage in the 1960s, uh, mid-1950s, um, besides a handful of musicians. And most musicians were trying to kind of get away from that, I think, because they associated it with these big dance bands, a lot of associated with racism um, because of minstrel shows and the nature of entertainment a bit earlier that century and for the hundred years prior to that of, of which we have like no recorded anything because that was before much before I, this kind of technology um so it was very tied with this so i think especially like the early bebop musicians far from from dance and from trying to please and send this kind of thing so they made a full turn and this um, also happened in the tap dance world much later, is actually, um, with nothing. We won't go into that. Um, but anyway, Marshall Stearns, he wrote this book with his wife, Jean, I believe her name is, and started just going out and finding these old dancers who most had retired, were doing other things, and he'd speak with them and record their conversations. And, and, and with many of them, was the first person to do so. And a lot of them died soon after he interviewed them. So it was very, very fortunate. And his book is an invaluable resource it's called Jazz Dance and American by Marshall and Gene Stearns. And it has so much. But anyway, he, he did this and he was quite involved with the, the faculty at Newport, I believe. And he, he made a lecture demonstration in the year 1962. And this was called A History of the Tap Dance and its Relation to Jazz. And he brought with him, um, who was there, I believe it was Chuck Green, Coles and Atkins, uh, Pete Nugent, and <laughs> maybe Lawrence, maybe. Um, Doug Bunny Briggs was also there. I don't know, some collection of these people. Pete Nugent. Uh, by the way, there's no video footage of it, uh, and was also well known around the Hoofers Club. Um, but so I bought them, they had this lecture demonstration, the history of tap dance, and this was kind of initiated perhaps 
uh, amongst other things, kind of getting back into the public eye for a lot of these dancers who are now some, like maybe Baby and Jimmy were in their prime and uh, maybe 40 years old or a bit younger and still really excited to dance. Others were already old timers and they'd been performing all their lives, but suddenly had no work since middle of the 40s, uh, if they were lucky. Um, but yeah, this happened and what else? There was one thing, last week we talked very briefly about Baby and Bunny, uh, but I'd like to show a video of each of these uh, dancers um, because I love them both. And I got a great opportunity to speak with Bunny while he was living in Las Vegas in his later years. And he, he talked about Baby a lot. And I was surprised because there's no, I mean, there's no video of this stuff. Um, but he mentioned working with Baby Lawrence. And then, then I read, I was looking into it today. Uh, they were working together at various periods, but maybe it was this first year with Marshall Stearns when they did this lecture demonstration, they were also performing with Duke Ellington, um, Baby Lawrence, Bunny Briggs, and they had kind of a challenge dance and the audience maybe judged who was the winner. Uh, so in this spirit, maybe we watch each of them and you guys can decide who you think might have won this particular challenge, but they're both vastly, vastly different. So to begin, let's watch a video of Baby Lawrence, AKA, the jazz hoofer. Uh, for this, this is actually an excerpt from a documentary entitled uh, "This the Jazz Hoofer," which I think is on YouTube. Also, we can find um, this is the year 1981, and he's improvising with a few musicians. So please enjoy. Thank you. 
Lawrence, how is the is the video smooth enough? I'm worried it's a bit out of sync today. Yes, I saw. Oh, it might be my internet. Oh well, we shall try our best. A lot of these are on uh, findable on the internet, so if you'd like to watch them again, um, write to me, or I'll try my best to to give the title so you can check these out again later if you wish. Um, Baby Lawrence, I mean, I talk about him perhaps too much, but he was really, I believe, ahead of his time with his, his dancing. And this is quite unique. I mean, this is the documentaries from the 80s. I don't know when this was filmed. It was probably several years earlier because I don't think he was alive then, actually. Um, he talks about it a little bit, but there were few dancers who changed the way of syncopation in the way that he did. There were just a handful. Uh, Honey Coles was probably one, also Bunny Briggs, um, John Bubbles in some ways. But the way they swung and the way they used their rhythms was extremely different to the way most people were dancing before that. Being Before that time, they were probably sticking to fairly uniform phrases, like being three in a break or eight bar phrases. Um, which you see in a lot of the old videos, it'll be like step after step after step, and it's very recognizable, the shapes. Whereas people like Baby Lawrence kind of just jumped over all the fences and pushed down the, the walls a bit, and we have modern jazz, and there's a bit of controversy over who started this, if it was the tap dancers or the drummers in the late 1940s, and no one really knows. I, of course, like to think it was the tap dancers. <laughs> But it's the same thing in the end because uh, a lot of a lot of musicians were dancers. A huge amount of musicians were dancers, um, which is wild to imagine. But yes, Baby Lawrence, very special uh, dancer and musician, and he has an album called Dance Master, perhaps, which is just him dancing with a band for a whole track. It has this lovely cover. You'll see him in all these different shapes. Um, but song after song, he just dances with, with a band, which was quite a new concept, I believe, in those years. So now let's check out Bunny Briggs, another favorite dancer of mine, who was also working with Baby at the Newport Jazz Festival sometime in the 1960s. There's so many videos of Bunny, and I, I think we've already watched a couple. This one's, I don't want to say obscure, but I... Yes, I, I'm so surprised to find this. I hope you enjoy. I really love this uh, video. Mr. Bunny Briggs. Don't be a thing if you ain't got that way. Woo! Yes, we do. 
Yeah, it's not the money breaks. I've got no idea where this video is from. It's just on YouTube. If anyone knows, I'd love to know. Did you hear the, who he mentioned was Nemsek? Patterson and Jackson, he said briefly. And I, maybe this is a thing they did. He goes, not now, and keeps dancing. I love this especially because we see it was a huge variety of, of dancers. And Bunny, I think, well, he considered himself a picture dancer, he would say, and liked to tell a story as he was dancing and often didn't tap dance. I mean, he was doing a bit of soft show, a bit of kind of sand things, but he's just really moving to the music. And there's a handful of beautiful performances of him doing this. But I believe he was quite the crowd pleaser. Would you have been able to choose the winner between Baby Lawrence and Buddy Bricks in a challenge? I mean, no, I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's another wonderful documentary called On My Taps, and they kind of reenact an old challenge like Sing, which was maybe more common. And they, they go around in the audience and start asking everyone who was their favorite of these three dancers who performed, which in this documentary is, is Bunny and uh, Chuck and uh, Sam and Sims. But yeah, nice to see. But yeah, there was a lot of, lot of dancers working with musicians for many, many years. Um, it was quite common for a big band to have a dance or two or three as kind of speciality acts in their pieces. It could have been floor shows at restaurant, kind of, I don't know what you call these venues, like sit down, cab type thing, people have their dinner or you sit down and then be a floor show and later maybe a social dance. This is, I think, quite a common band. You'd have a dancer make a super club, supper club, a super supper club <laughs> with soup. There, yeah, there was a, many different kinds of venues, but hmm, musicians and dancers very much. And we just had a small glimpse of it in these videos, especially for the 40s. They made quite a few short they just call them shorts and maybe they're 10 minutes, 15 minutes long, some of them, and they'll be with a band such as Duke Ellington or, or Jimmy Lansford or, um, and they'll have a couple of acts come out, whether they be eccentric dancers or tap dancers, Lindy Hop dancers often. Um, so speaking of, I shall now pass it to my friend um, to speak about Ramona, you're muted still. Oops. <laughs> so I just launched right into it. No, no, no. Um, what I was saying was just how grateful I feel to be doing these on Monday night and how much I look forward to them and yeah, what they mean to me um, and what it means that you care too. Um, I had a thought it might be interesting to watch the clip first actually and, and you can just take it in and have an impression and, and make your own connections to what you've seen so far. And then we can have a little chat um, about the people in the clip and what they were doing. How's that sound, Tommy? Let's do it.
like to do for you. Then up to it, it's easy to do. Call it the Galloway Boogie. Galloway Boogie. Galloway Boogie. Galloway Boogie. Keeps you groovy 24 hours a day. You like music with the boogie beat? Dig this jive jack. The Galloway Boogie. The Galloway Boogie. Galloway Boogie. Galloway Boogie. Keeps you groovy 24 hours a day. This bebop and jive. Dig this boogie, keep you alive. Galloway boogie, Galloway boogie, Galloway boogie, keeps you groovy 24 hours a day. Well, <laughs> did you guys see any of that? Not so much. Um, well, we have a couple of options. Of course, you could, we could all like exit the full screen and go watch it on our, you know, do all of that. Um, did you see any of it or what did you see what I saw, which was mostly frozen? Yeah, maybe we're better off sharing the links. It could be the internet today, hey? It's not our friend. Mm -mm. I believe... The music did play. Okay. Do you want to talk about this one? I'll see if I can find the links to, to all this stuff. Sure thing. Yeah, so that was Cab Calloway, the great Cab Calloway, who was born on Christmas Day in Rochester, New York. I think it was 1907. Um, he, his mother was a teacher, his father was a lawyer, and around, I think, the age of five, they moved to Baltimore, um, seven, eight, nine, a kid, they moved to Baltimore. Um, and that clip actually you saw of Baby Lawrence was, was uh, taking place in Baltimore. Um, his sister, Blanche Calloway, five years older, born in 1902. She was having a very successful career as a performer and as actually the first woman to lead a band of all male musicians. This was a huge thing, the first woman, period. Um, so she's a super cool, cool figure in jazz. You should check her out. Um, she did a lot of dancing and of course Cav got inspired uh, by her. He, well, he sounds like quite a character. He, he got into taking private voice lessons when he was in high school. Um, he started to work a little bit at some jazz clubs and his teachers and, 
and mother, his father actually passed away. His father uh, transitioned when he was nine years old. And you can imagine that's pretty formative. Um, but anyway, it's just an, another reminder of how jazz was viewed or looked upon, that it was pretty uh, not encouraged. They, they were, had high hopes that he'd become a lawyer, just like his father. But uh, he ended up in Chicago in college, and his sister got him a job at uh, the Sunset Cafe. Um, which is at the time where Louis Armstrong was playing. And so even though he was the MC at the club, uh, he was soaking up all of that goodness and that rhythm. And of course, the scat singing that Louis Armstrong was doing. He befriended, he kind of made an initial connection, which proved to be extremely uh, fruitful and fortuitous later on when he moved to Harlem. Um, an interesting note is that his very first gig with a band called the Alabamians, they got their gig in New York at the Savoy Ballroom and they were up against the Missourians and also Cecil Scott and his band and it was a total flop. They were like, it was disastrous actually because they, yeah, he, he spoke about it himself. They weren't really playing music for dancers. Um, and, but of course he persevered. You know, there's so much to learn about the life of a jazz musician and a performer and an entertainer at that time. He really, as Tommy has said, it's needing to get the gig and, and working and, and staying in the, in the game. He was cast, he got a, a lucky break, I think through his sister maybe in a, in a Broadway show. He ended up singing Ain't Misbehavin', Fats Waller's major hit, at one of the many, excuse me. Um, and it got to the point where the Savoy Ballroom was calling him up and saying, hey, can you be the front man? Can you, can you lead a band for us? Um, so, so there were ups and there were downs. Um, there was a time that he, he actually asked Louis Armstrong to help get him a gig. But in the end, he ended up at the Cotton Club in 1930. He took over after Duke's spot. I mean, he took over after the Duke Ellington band exited and, and that was a, a, some big shoes to fill, but he was, the most successful uh, band um, of that in terms of money. He was revenue and, and kind of that, if you're looking at that, more successful than Ellington, Basie, Lunsford. He, had, he sold a million copies of Minnie the Moocher. That was huge. And that allowed him, he toured the South, the Jim Crow South, which at the time, if you were an entertainer, well, first things first, is extremely dangerous. Um, but he, he, was, he had his own train. So his musicians would sleep on the train, actually, which was the safest place. And they could just go from town to town, city to city, and, and they were just huge. They were huge. Um, so he had a lot of kind of, I, I think, some leeway there just because he was, he was so big. Um, he played until the club, the Cotton Club closed in 1940. So he had a 10 year run there. Um, and he was just huge. And really what he brought was so much energy and you didn't get to see it, but he's dancing. He was, a, he was such a dancer. He really fused vaudeville and jazz in this way. Um, he was the father, kind of in a way, the beginning of this idea of a front man because he didn't play any instruments. He sang, um, but he just brought the party. I mean, he would get on stage and he just made it happen. And he had this signature kind of call and response, hi 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 and then the, the audience would give it back to him. And this was a really, you know, breaking that fourth wall and, and interacting. Not that there was a fourth wall in jazz, but he, he was, uh, he really was going for it. Um, and he wrote, he wrote songs. He's, he's like a big deal. And you might just look at him as, as very much an entertainer, um, which he 100% was, but uh, he was very multifaceted. When, when the swing era was kind of waning in the 1940s, he got into Broadway. He was in Porgy and Bess, Hello Dolly. And this clip, which you will see, was from 1950. He's doing a boogie woogie, which was very much the, the style at the time. He had Panama Francis on drums, Bill Tinton on bass, which you might know that name, Jonah Jones on trumpet, and uh, Dave Rivera on piano. And he's dancing with Marie Bryant, which you also did not see. Um, but she, we've talked about her a little bit. She is so wonderful. Um, you should definitely check her out. Um, wow, he, he was larger than life. He had this huge voice. He, he, 
he moved in such a unique and authentic way. Um, and he, he was absolutely himself. There's a great clip of Cab Calloway and Jimmy Slide in France somewhere. Um, we'll have to show that sometime or you'll have to look it up. It's very long, um, but their interaction and, and just to see these great entertainers on stage, the way he handled himself, the way he worked the stage. Um, and he was kind of like the beginning of the idea of a front man for a band, which is to look, look back and go back. And the idea that, that you danced and you, 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 uh, you kind of brought the, brought the show. I'm going down the Cab Calloway rabbit hole, you guys, and it's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, I, might, I might leave it at that. What else did I want to say about the clip? Well, he, 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 he's a tap, he tap dances, man. You watch Cab Calloway. Any, go on YouTube, find any clip, you will see him doing it all. And it is like, you, you get all of your boxes get a little bit broken down, you know, the way that you want to put things in categories. You just, you got to free yourself, you know? And I think, um, I think there's a great quote about what is swing. Someone asked Louis Armstrong. He's like, man, if you're asking me, You'll never know. Maybe it was somebody asking Duke Ellington. No, somebody asked Duke Ellington what, 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 he, what, was, you know, what he listened to. Well, you know, what, what kind of music do you like? And Duke goes, good music. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's, there's, it's so important to look back, to learn, to educate, to pay our respects. But ultimately, there's, um, there's this spirit of, of the dance that lives on that has never died. You know, this, the spirit of community and of, of the culture, black culture, uh, these traditions that came from Africa, they, they just transform, they just adapt. And so you had maybe tap dancing went out of style, the Lindy Hop, social, dancing together, lead and follow, partner dancing. But you look at Motown, you look at funk, you look at Boogie, you look at Prince, you look at hip hop, run DMC. I mean, the, there's really this through line and I don't like to, see, to think so much that these things die, but they just transform. Um, and they also have different messengers that bring their message. And uh, um, well, that would be an interesting segue into maybe some of more of this, this modern noise funk, you know, this, this, this time. I'm sure you'll see, get there eventually, but uh, yeah, just the music. Eventually, Tommy, yes. how am I doing? <laughs> No, sounds great. Sounds um, great. But I, I'm just so grateful you're all, you're all here. And all the, the links. You found the links? Great. Um, and I'm going to so. turn it back over to, to Tommy. And we will see you soon, as in now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marla. Oh, you're welcome. Well, yes, let's see how long my internet lasts us tonight. I'm sorry. Maybe let's try one more and see how we go. If it's terrible, I've found all the links on YouTube and maybe we just uh, take like a few minutes and we can go watch them and return or something like this. Might be a bit smoother anyway. Um, but yes, yes. So now the hoofers we've reached at last. Um, I should make a disclaimer, perhaps, before we begin, that there, there's almost no women in this, which is um, a bit surprising. Uh, but it was very much a fraternity of sorts in, in that time and around the Hoofers Club also, this, this venue that was in the back of the, the pool room in Harlem. But also, Yes, who can say why? I'm, I'm sure it's a thing of the time as well. It, it was difficult in general, I think, for women to find work. The expectations in life were very different uh, present. And in entertainment, no more so than in regular work. So if you're a, if you're a woman, you'd be lucky to get a job as a soloist. And it was quite a rarity. Um, not to say there were not people who did this, there were some, but for the most part, chorus girls or uh, there were a few like trios and quartets um, made of all women. Um, and there's some wonderful videos, but it's hard to even tell how truthful the dancing is because there's many stories that they would have to hold back to not upstage their 
male um, contemporaries, which is quite funny to think about. Um, but there was definitely a lot more female dancers and, and musicians than we know about. Um, just to say, we're about to go into the world of men as we go into the hoofers a little bit. Uh, but with that said, let's begin. Is and where to begin? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there's um. I don't even know where this word came from, but it does get thrown around a lot nowadays. But apparently, it, it just means could mean someone who focuses more on the sound of their their taps, on the the rhythms, on the syncopations. Maybe less concerned with the physical appearance. Um, but it's not always the case because there was a huge variety amongst them. But this is often what hoofing means. Uh, the hoofers club was the place. The hoofers came up much later and it became another kind of club, but during the 60s, middle of the 60s, and probably sometime after these kind of happenings at Newport and, and, and this jazz dance book being written by Marshall Stearns, um, there was a dancer named, well, I'm not sure when he began, but his name is Lon Chaney. His first name was Isaiah, but he goes by the name of Lon Chaney, who is also, there's another Lon in these old black and white horror films, but this is not him. It's, um, he was the terrible. But before that, a prize fight, I believe, in, in Harlem, and quite uh, maybe a successful one at that. But at some stage, he met Baby Lawrence in a grocery store, I hope, and was, somehow saw him dance, was thoroughly inspired and started working himself. And I might've heard it, there's another documentary with, um, about Peg Leg Bates, who's another beautiful dancer. And Lon talks quite a bit in this and you hear a bit of his story. Um, but yeah, so he started dancing. And then during the sixties, when there was very little work for tap dancers, he was kind of keen to get some of these people who were still out and about doing their thing, where they're just dancing at home. Some were doing things in small jazz clubs or, or venues, but very few. And a few who managed, well, mostly in Europe, actually, uh, such as Jimmy Slide, he expatriated, as you say, to Paris, and he was living there many years. Um, but in the US, it was suddenly just not cool to be dancing for reasons where maybe we've said, but hugely to do with race, I believe, even if it wasn't explicitly said at that time, but it was just, yes, yeah, so it leaned towards other things, boogie woogie, uh, rock and roll. Uh -huh. But so Lon knew, and I mean, all these dancers and musicians probably knew each other still and were still hanging out. Um, and so Lon was kind of keen to get people together, but didn't know how to get people together. So he decided to make a challenge and he called it the Battle of the Taps. And it happened in a basement uh, somewhere or maybe later, but it was at a venue called the Purple Manor, somewhere on 125th Street in Harlem. And they do it every Monday night. And he advertised that uh, he had Baby Lawrence and Chuck Green come along. The first half they do like kind of a little bit of a show. The second half, it was an open competition of sorts. And you could get up on the stage and challenge any of the dancers you saw present. And it attracted like a huge variety of dancers, I'm sure. Um, and went for, it's hard to tell how long, there's really not much information about this stuff, but it sounds like it went for quite some years on Monday nights. I don't know if it was regular or started and stopped, but it sounded like it, it kept going. Uh, apparently Honey Coles, who at that time was working as manager of the Apollo Theater, he'd come and watch sometimes with his uh, friends who they had another club called the, the Copacetics, which was another fraternity of sorts, which formed after Bill Robinson's death. And they'd come and watch, but often wouldn't compete because at least the story goes, they weren't so much into the, the cutthroat competition aspect of tap dancing or jazz. Um, so they were content to watch. But Honey had a little bit of quite some connections being working at the Apollo and, and at some stage shifted them to a theater from this small venue, still on Monday nights. And so they kept up this battle of the taps, battle of the taps for uh quite uh, a little while um a few of the dancers i'm sure i've seen videos of but i can no longer find them one his name was big rhythm red and i'm sure i've seen a video of this man dancing but it's 
vanished. He had like a little bit of a belly and uh, danced very lightly, uh, but he was a regular at these Battle of the Taps, Big Rhythm Red. Also, who else would have been there often? Um, definitely Chuck. I think Sandman Sims also, who you'll see in my maps on my taps, made quite a many appearance. Um, but yes, that was them. So Lon perhaps was kind of the, the gathering force of this at this time, but I'm sure it was many people also. Uh, so maybe let's attempt to watch a video of Mr. Lon Chaney, who popularized the step called the paddle and the roll and see how it goes. This is a short one. If it's terrible, then I think we go to, we, I'll, I'll give us the links so we can go and check these out. So please enjoy a hopefully smooth video. Paddle and roll is a big man dance. A rhythm that comes from the heel and toe and is better known as a drum solo. The drummer play power fiddles on the drum. <laughs> Tap dance is played with the feet. At this point, I shall challenge this dance without the music. Let me see what I can get from the soul. Chaney. How was the connection that time? Okay, okay. Well, let me know if the we we try a few more. If if it goes bad again, then I I, I think I'll put the links anyway to these. This um I actually took an excerpt because there's a whole uh it has the whole concert of this. It's from it's called the American Jazz Tap Festival in 1987, and I don't remember where this took place, but they have the whole concert on YouTube. Uh, just the sound's not great, but it gives you an idea of uh, this um, show they were doing at the time, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But that was Lon Chaney, the battle and roll, and he often introduced it as this, as a big man's step, and would go into this stuff. Ho, 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 ho. And hard to imagine he's, uh, like, had such powerful sounds, I'm sure, like the floor had been shaking which is hard to grasp just from this video, but very impressive dancer. Um, 
And yes, he popularized also a routine of sorts that they do often in these Battle of the Tap shows that they call the track, which everyone would line up and uh, do the paddle and roll. And one by one, they'd come out and take a solo. And this stayed quite a part of it and also made its way into the Broadway production of Black and Blue, which happened many years later. You'll see them doing the track in this, but this is from Lon Chaney. Uh, yes, absolutely love his dancing. But so nice to see. It's so different, like each of these dancers are so different and they really have their, their own language of, it's wildly different from, from each other. Yeah, it's just impressive for me to even fathom. But yes, what else was happening? This thing was going on. There was a producer of, well, the producer of the Newport Jazz Festival, whose name was George Veen. He was quite, I think he's kind of well-known or was well-known as being a jazz impresario. And he's, I mean, helped Newport begin. Uh, soon after, I found out he organized a drum battle tour in Japan. Of which uh, Baby Lawrence went along, also with Philly Joe Jones and um, Buddy Rich, I think. Uh, and yes, they were working together, which I, I wish there was a video of this stuff. There is a video which we're about to watch of another tour that happened that also George Bean organized um, that happened around 1966, 1967 in Europe. And he organized four dancers to go, who were Jimmy Slide, Buster Brown, Chuck Green, and who's the other? We'll see in the video, I guess. Did I say four already? <laughs> we'll see the video and, uh, and uh, it'll all come together. But this, I, I don't know where it appeared, but somewhere on YouTube like a year ago. And it is, I think like, the best um, I've seen of dancers dancing, but it's so short. And I, I wrote to the, the people who organized it, one's from a jazz festival in Berlin, one's from somewhere in France, I don't know where, uh, but apparently they don't have footage. Like the, the, the organizer of the jazz festival in Berlin wrote me back this beautiful email, um, but he said, sorry, something went wrong on the day and that's all the videos I have, this one minute segment which is more than a little bit depressing, but anywho, let's uh, please enjoy this. This is from, let's watch maybe the one from France first. This is from the year 1967 uh, with Buster, Jimmy, Baby and Chuck. It's very short. We, I'll, I'll play them both back to back. Then we'll talk some more. four of the greatest tap dancers in the world today and they're going to come on and you and they'll introduce themselves as they go along but we're going to bring them on as four people jimmy slide buster brown chuck green and baby lawrence
Die einzige authentische Form des Jazz-Tanzes ist der Tap-Dance, wie er sich in Harlem in den 40er und 50er Jahren gebildet hat. Viele große Jazzorchester, zum Beispiel Duke Ellington, hatten damals ihre eigenen Tänzer. Lange Jahre hindurch waren diese Tänzer Lehrmeister für Fred Astaire und Gene Kelly, die in Hollywood aus dem schwarzen Step-Tanz eine Mode des internationalen Showgeschäfts gemacht haben. That was Jimmy Slide. We saw taking a solo there. Yes, I have the link to this one. Um, I don't know the best way to do. It. Maybe I'll, I'll post them on the on the Facebook page or something. Um, so nice, crazy that this is. I, I think one of the best recordings of tap dance from any time. But there's there's just so few of these dancers in there really their, their era. There's so, so few. Um, I can't believe the recording didn't work on this day because this was a jazz festival. Surely they have the whole concert, but no, apparently not. Um, before that, we saw Buster Brown taking a solo in the one from France. Um, this was a tour, I believe they did for, I don't know if they went back and forwards or it stayed there for a couple of years. Who can say? Um, there yeah, are a bunch of things happening. Jimmy Slide, maybe he could have already been living in Paris at that time. I'm not sure. Incredible dancer though. And as his name implies, well known for his sliding. And this, I believe, came from when he was quite young. He made a duo with another dancer whose name was Jimmy Mitchell. They were called the Slide Brothers. And when they were very young, uh, maybe teenagers, they kind of went on the, the vaudeville circuit. But, but Jimmy was kind of young and caught just the, the tail end of, of this kind of entertainment before the big shift happened. So it was kind of unfortunate for him, I think, uh, because he got to see so many incredible performers and then suddenly just there was no demand for, for the same kind of live entertainment. So fully trained for, for something that no longer was as needed. Well, I think it was probably very much needed, but not in such demand. Um, but that was Jimmy. He learned to do school that was called Stanley Brown's School in Boston. There was a one-man dance school when he was a child. And probably one of the few of these dancers of the Hoofers who we're talking about who learned in a dance school. 
I think the majority of them learned from friends or dancing um, on the street, trading steps, stealing steps. Jimmy, for a time at least, learned at Stanley Brown School, which apparently would have guests, like maybe John Bubbles would come to visit at times, or a few other dancers, because they were good friends with, with uh, Stanley um, and whoever was teaching there. But that was Jimmy. Lots of stuff. What else? Let me consult my notes. The hoofers. Yes, then, around the same kind of time, that's when, like 1966, 1967, 1969, they say, there another show came about that was called Tap Happening. And this was organized by a lady whose name was Letitia J, who was, she was on the burlesque and variety show circuit for a while. She was probably quite a bit younger than these dancers. Um, but she got very inspired by tap dancing it and, and wanted to help promote it because she saw all these incredible artists just not working. But also at this time, there was this battle of taps thing going on with, with Lon and the other, these other hoofers. Um, but so she tried to gather some like attention and started promoting and made the show that they called Tap Happening. And it revolved around Chuck Green, who she was working with for quite a time, I think helping take care of him and um, maybe performing sometimes because Chuck at this period was in and out of uh, some mental institutions because he had quite some troubles after he split with his partner, uh, his dance partner, much earlier, I don't know when, maybe sometime in the 30s or who knows. Um, I think maybe his, he was part of a duo called Chuck and Chuckles. They were the protégés of Buck and Bubbles and they replicated the act of Buck and Bubbles but as children. And they were working together for many, many years but then eventually Chuckles, um, I think moved overseas maybe and yeah, Chuck just did not do well after that and found himself in a, a, in a place where they take care of people. And so I, I think many tap dancers also throughout these couple of decades were visiting him and taking care of him also. Um, and they say he was, when he was dancing, he was okay. And as soon as he was on stage, he just knew what to do. And it was really magical, but, but at other times it, it, was, it was a challenge. And, and you see in a handful of interviews, his, it gives him a very strange kind of enigmatic feeling about, I don't, it's, it's almost like he's channeled into something else. He's very, everything he says seems to have an extra layer underneath it. Um, very special man and, and on stage too. Um, and I believe even during all these years, he was considered by many the best tap dancer. Um, he might have even been Baby's favorite tap dancer. I could have this wrong. But just incredible, so such a lovely dancer. Um, but what next? There's still many. Let's watch one more of Jimmy's slide because I've got a nice one to share of him. Um, there was during one of, um, oh, I got distracted, tap happening. This show was, uh, she organized this show and it revolved around Chuck Green and the first act was him kind of reminiscing about working with John Bubbles and working with these old performers. And the second act, again, they do kind of a challenge thing as they were doing in the Battle of the Taps and it would attract, again, kind of like general audience or other dancers who wanted to challenge people on stage. Um, so this started running and was apparently quite successful and they moved it to a big theater and then they were doing something like eight shows a week in late 60s. Um, and at various times they started, they'd tour it. And I think on and off it was on tour for maybe eight years, but I can find almost no information on this, but. I read, uh, I should cite my sources more carefully, but somewhere I said eight year tour, uh, which very much shocked me because this is like beginning 1969. I know their initial production shut down after just three months, but then with different groups uh, who called themselves the Hoofers, they'd be traveling. Um, they did a tour to Africa at one point, um, performing for the King of uh, somewhere and uh, all over Europe uh, and several times in the United States as well. But I don't know how regular this was. I don't know. 
yeah, it's it's all a big, big mystery. Um, but yeah, there was kind of a ro revolving roster of dancers who all called themselves the Hoofers. Um, some who there's not really much documentation on. Uh, Rhythm Red, we talked about, Big Rhythm Red, John Chivers, I believe is his real name. Um, there's another called George Hillman, who was also in Black and Blue much later and was an old time entertainer and uh, very charismatic on stage. There was a dancer named Raymond Carland, who apparently um, danced with Jump Rope and the Soft Shoe. Um, yeah, Sam Man Sims did a Sam dance, uh, who you, you can see in my maps on my taps. Um, there was another wonderful sand dancer who I believe there's a video of her on YouTube also. Her name's Harriet Brown, who's incredible. I don't know if Sam Men knew her, surely, yes. Uh, but yeah, she's an incredible sand dancer. Uh, not part of the office, but great dancer. So yeah, there was this revolving roster. They do different shows, um, a few TV specials here and there. But um, that was tap happening. And in a way, it's Slowly, slowly, people found their way to tap dance through different ways. And maybe we'll talk about that another time when it kind of had a renaissance of sorts, similar, very similar to swing dance. Um, but it never died, despite, despite the, what people say. It, it just was hidden for a little while. But many dancers were working throughout their lives, like from 30s until, I mean, early in the, the century until they were elderly folks, which was very impressive, even during these hard years where there was not a lot, people found ways. Um, Jimmy, as I said, moved to, moved to Paris. He started working at small jazz clubs and things. Later, he organized a jam in New York, maybe when he was living there again, uh, at a place called La Cave, which became very popular with uh, young dancers. And some people such as like Max Pollack and Roxanne Butterfly found their ways to these jams, some contemporary dancers who got to see some of the old timers dancing. But speaking of Jimmy, let's check out one more video of him because uh, there can never be too much Jimmy slide. But this is from, it looks like, it doesn't say on YouTube, but I, it looks like it's from one of these world tours of the Hoofers and it's from 1977. And in the background, you might see Harold Cromer, which I'm so curious, he was there. Okay, here we go. He's dancing to Here's That Rainy Day.
not to do a slide. His real name was James Titus Godbolt in his early days. <laughs> Beautiful name. Yes, one of my most favorite dancers. There's a great video in his later years. He was dancing till he was maybe 80 years old. Incredible, like that, dancing like that at 80 years old. It's wild. I hope I am so fortunate. Oy, oy, oy. Well, before I rant too much more, let's watch another one of Buster Brown, who we haven't talked about much, who I don't actually know a lot to be a lot about, to be honest, but he's he's very known amongst the New York community. Um, there's a, a dancer named Michaela Lerman now, a young dancer who's been working uh, uh, with Winter Marsalis and a bunch of uh, great musicians also, but she was very close with Buster, I believe, for many years. Buster in his later years ran a, a, a jam in the 90s at a club called Swing 46 that ran for quite a few years and was also like a gathering place for young dancers and weekly thing that was very, very popular. But I think he did a lot to, to kind of get young people dancing. Uh, but yes, he, yeah, old time performer, was around the, the circuits performing with different groups um some trios and i don't know if he was dancing during kind of the the dip of things uh but he was dancing for himself every day uh anyhow let's watch him this this is from a te television special also of they call themselves the original hoofers in 1972 with buster brown i apologize for the quality because it's not the best but it's one of the few of buster brown dancing hope you enjoy Ladies and gentlemen, our group consisting of Buster Brown, Bert Gibson, Teacher's Teacher, Fred Kelly, Chuck Green, Jimmy Slide, and yours truly, Ralph.
what is known as a soft shoe tap. If you didn't have tap shoes, you would call it a hard sock tap. <laughs> I would like to say that I think tap dancing is about the most beneficial way of staying in shape. And it's so easy to do, honest. If it looks hard, that's because we're putting a little more effort to it, selling it, as we say. But basically, tap dancing is just like walking. If you can walk, you can dance. This is walking. Now put a little effort to it and you're dancing. See what I mean? And you usually walk according to the way you feel. If you feel happy and carefree, you give it this. You don't care, you're deep down into the blue to give it this. Blue, And you say you're on Fifth Avenue and you like to do a little window shopping, you give it this. Well, there's a big lit up street down town New York. It's called 42nd Street. You usually walk on this street like this. <laughs> Thought I'd add a little humor. <laughs> Over in Brooklyn, they call it's a street up there. They call it a, a se section. I think they call it Bedford Stuyvesant Era. <laughs> you walk like this. <laughs> you got to be careful. I said all this to say one thing. I love tap dancing. I'm so happy that it looks like it's coming back. Mm -hmm. One more year and I wouldn't be able to make it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to give you my conception of my favorite type of dance. All types of dancing up here. Mine, I picked out rhythm. Rhythm goes like this. Thank <laughs> you. 
There was one dancer there who also I know very little about. His name was Bert Gibson. He was the second from the left who they mentioned, who he was who apparently was performing often with the hoofers as well, but there's no information about him. Uh, I'd like to ask some people. Well, time is swiftly escaping us. And I think perhaps we have time for one video more. And perhaps it's the moment to watch a little bit of Chuck Green, who is known as the dancer's dancer. And it's hard to, I, I say all of these dancers are my favorite, but Chuck Green is really my favorite. Uh, yeah, just wild. And then the video we saw earlier with, with them dancing in, in Paris and Berlin, um, I think it is so special also because you see him so sharp and really on top of his game. Uh, not to say he's not in these later videos, but he dances very differently. And I mean, they've, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's impressive. They're, they're dancing still all these years, but I would have loved really to see Chuck dancing in the 1930s. It would have been wild. Um, but let's have a look at him. Again, he was the protege of John Bubbles and was working for many years performing um, and much later again with the Hoofers and was kind of who at least for a little while was who the show revolved around tap happening. Um, but then I think the later tour, it was just kind of more like this. Maybe each of them would come out, do a little bit of shtick and talk a bit, dance a bit and show their thing. And they'd do a few, few numbers together. Um, all very much soloists. They were in the day, I'm sure many of them were also performing as duos or trios. Um, but very individual in the, in the way they moved and danced. Um, so, thank you for coming again tonight. I'm sorry uh, for the internet. Ah! Oh, yeah, yeah, he wasn't our friend at the beginning. Hopefully, my well, next time. I'm not sure if we'll do another or not in two weeks. I'm undecided. Um, are you guys around in two weeks? It's kind of like, I don't even know when that is, December, <laughs> something, something. Well, we see, I, I, I post up, um, but yes, definitely in the new year, there'll be some more and we'll continue these probably every two weeks again, because uh, um, I'm enjoying it. And there's still a lot of videos. So I hope, uh, I hope you're enjoying too. And please feel free to write if you have any questions and, um, yeah, thank you, Ramon, and thank you, 1929, for, for hosting this evening. Um, could not do it without you. And if if you'd like to donate, it's also completely up to you. There's a link on the Facebook thing somewhere. Um, definitely not necessary. Let's check out Chuck Green and see his dancing. This video, when I, it always stuck in my mind as Chuck Green after seeing this and it, uh, it's a great one. There's so many, um, but he's dancing to the eight train. Many of these dancers had a song that they were kind of became their song or a handful of songs. For Buster Brown, it was often cute. If we know this tune. Bum, 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 dee, dee. Then there's a break. Dun, 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 dun. Chaka, chaka, dunk. Was Buster's tune, but many dancers used it, but it was kind of his thing. For Chuck, it was the A train or caravan. He used these two very, very often. So we're going to see him dancing to take the A train. This is from sometime in the 1980s. Um, hmm. So please enjoy. I'll play this and then we shall say good night. Thank you again.
Green. Thank you all again. Hopefully, maybe see you in two weeks. I shall keep you posted. Um, otherwise, have a nice Christmas and holidays. And yeah, lovely to, to have you all here for these, these sessions. Until next time.